What happened to Dan Fogelberg? Dan Fogelberg was born in 1951 in Peoria, Illinois, into a musical family, which let him have an early passion for music, and he began playing the piano. His interest in music grew, especially after being introduced to the Beatles and discovering the world of songwriting. He formed bands such as The Clan and The Coachman, where he played Beatles songs and evolved his musical taste. However, he pursued other goals, initially studying drama and painting at the University of Illinois. Fogelberg rekindled his music career amid the Vietnam War era at a club called the Red Herring. He gained local attention, which eventually led to his discovery by Irving Azoff, who moved to Los Angeles to help him sign with a record label. His debut album, Home Free, recorded in Nashville, showcased a beautiful blend of country rock and singer-songwriter elements, though it lacked hit singles for mainstream success. Despite critical acclaim, the album struggled due to the music industry's genre segregation. Fogelberg continued as a session musician, working on various albums. He got a second chance with his album Souvenirs, recorded in Los Angeles with Joe Walsh. With hits like Part of the Plan, the album achieved double platinum status and marked a significant breakthrough in his career. Fogelberg was now a star and leading an Illinois Bond band called Fool's Gold and touring almost constantly for the next two years. In the midst of it all, he completed a third album called Captured Angel in 1975, which he produced himself this time, which showed him extending a sound in more ambitious directions and surprising circumstances. It was during 1975 that he returned home to spend time with his father who had been hospitalized and afterward, while staying in Peoria, cut what was supposed to be demos of the songs he wanted to use on his new album, with Fogelberg playing every instrument and doing all of the vocals. Instead, when Azoff and Davis heard the demos, they insisted that this was the album and that he could never recapture the feel he'd gone on songs like Comes and Goes, working with other musicians. He eventually came to an agreement with the label that the percussion parts would be redone by Russ Kunkel, and the final version of Captured included Norbert Putnam on bass on certain tracks, Al Perkins on pedal steel guitar, and David Lindley on fiddle, plus some string arrangements by Glenn Spring. But otherwise, it was truly a Fogelberg solo effort. That album only solidified his fame, as well as making him a special favorite of college students across the country and a tour with the Eagles in 1975, who by then were being managed by Azoff, only enhanced his profile. Fogelberg moved to Colorado in the mid-70s, and his initial time there resulted in the songs that became the basis for his next album, Netherlands, in 1977. Ironically, the songs came at the end of an extended dry spell as a songwriter, the first of his adult life. He found himself unable to compose for months and then suddenly he started writing again, but in a much more elaborately conceived, classically influenced idiom. The songs were bolder both lyrically and musically. The title track in particular was noble for employing the services of composer slash arranger. Dominique Frontier in orchestrating it. The album was a hit and he was still riding the initial wave of recognition and the concerts that went with it, even if he was now taking the audience in some unexpected directions. Fogelberg decided at this point to step back a bit, get off that wave and do something purely for his satisfaction musically. In 1978, he began work on a record that was to be more of a personal indulgence than anything else, the non-commercial side of Dan Fogelberg, sort of his equivalent to those instrumental albums that Frank Sinatra had issued as a conductor a couple of times in his career. And another example, Neil Young's later, Everybody's Rocking. He teamed up on what would become a duo album with jazz flutist 
Tim Weisberg for the album Twin Sons of Different Mothers in 1978. But instead of being a curio or a footnote in his output, it ended up charting high and generating a huge hit single in the guise of The Power of Gold, which ironically had been added to the LP at the last minute. The album ended up in the top 20 and was embraced by critics and the public alike. For the next few years, Funkelberg was writing a creative and commercial whirlwind, peaking with his 1980 album, Phoenix, which was propelled to platinum status with help from the number two single, Longer. The year before, he also fulfilled a longtime career goal by playing Carnegie Hall in New York to a sellout audience that included his parents. Fogelberg's career in the 1980s began with an unexpected turn. Concept albums were common enough by then, but most record labels also tended to strongly discourage the recording of double LPs, owing to the expense and the difficulties in selling and marketing them. But midway through finishing his next album, and with the single Same Old Lang Syne already in release in record stores and buyers poised for a new LP, he suddenly decided to expand the planned record, writing new songs and effectively doubling its length as well as delaying it well into 1981, the better part of a year beyond what the label or his manager had planned on. The result was his boldest production to date, The Innocent Age from 1981, a massive project featuring some VIP collaborators like Joni Mitchell and Emmylou Harris, from which four hit singles, the earlier Same Old Lang Syne, plus Run for the Roses, Hard to Say, and Leader of the Band, the latter of which was a tribute to his father, were ultimately extracted. That album marked his commercial peak and seemed to end a phenomenally popular and productive phase of his career. As though to mark the transition, the following year, Epic released its first hits compilation on Fogelberg, a 10-song LP on which four of the slots were filled by the singles off of The Innocent Age. It was three years before his next new album, during which time Fogelberg's musical sensibilities evolved in new and more specialized directions. He turned toward more personal and experimental forms of music, none of which proved remotely as popular with the public or with the critics as his 70s work. Additionally, as was the case with many artists of the 1970s and earlier, the playing field was fundamentally altered in the 1980s. MTV and music videos as promotional devices became central to gain exposure and airplay, and recording artists now needed a distinct visual style as well as a sound to make it to the front rank. Additionally, a new generation of music critics, most of whom were bent on showing contempt for most of the favorite artists of the previous decade or two, were now speaking in the press. His 1984 album, Windows and Walls, did reach the fans and even generated a hit in Language of Love, but got a hostile reception from the critics of the period. And his turn towards bluegrass music helped in part by his contact with Chris Hillman, who also turned back to his bluegrass roots at the time and recorded Fogelberg's Morning Sky as the title track of his latest album. And that move right there did not make him any more accessible to the mainline music critics of the day. The resulting album, High Country Snows from 1985, was a good seller and showed off Fogelberg's roots brilliantly, but did nothing to enhance his pop credibility, which had waned considerably over the previous three years. Fogelberg withdrew somewhat in the years that followed, Playing incognito at bars around Colorado as part of an outfit called Frankie and the Aliens, formed by Joe Fitel. He seemed to be headed back to his teenage roots and in the process redefined himself musically. When he reemerged with the Wild Places and the world beat flavored River of Souls in the early 90s, he was writing what amounted to topical songs about the environment, a subject with which he'd become more concerned since moving permanently to Colorado. 
By that time, he'd established a fully equipped home studio that provided him with the independence that he craved, and he was beholden to the record label merely as a line for his work. Epic, for its part, kept releasing Fogelberg's music, including a superb 1991 live album called Greetings from the West, and his earlier albums made perennially popular CD releases. Home Free was also extensively remixed by Norbert Putnam for its CD re-release in 1988. Indeed, all of Fogelberg's compact discs reflected an unusual degree of care in their production, especially for Columbia catalog reissues of the era, when the label was often just slapping down the digital masters and batting them out without an eye towards quality. In 1995, he and Tim Weisberg did another collaboration together, No Resemblance Whatsoever, which seemed to pick up right where their 1978 album had left off without skipping a beat. In 1997, Columbia honored Fogelberg with a four-CD career retrospective compilation entitled Portrait, the music of Dan Fogelberg from 1972 to 1997, looking back over his 25 years of previous work. Fogelberg closed out the old century with First Christmas Morning, which saw him plunge several centuries into the past in pursuing traditional holiday music, evoking sounds that in the context of work from a pop rock artist was quite rare at that time, and he was one of the first to do that. Finally, in 2003, Fogelberg went back to the acoustic singer-songwriter sound of his early career with the appropriately titled Full Circle Album. This seemed like the possible opening of a promising new phase to his work and career. Those prospects were dashed in mid-2004, however, when Fogelberg was diagnosed with advanced prostate cancer to which he finally succumbed in late 2007. And that's what happened to Dan Fogelberg. Thank you for watching. Like and subscribe if you haven't already. And give me some facts about him that I failed to mention. And let me know who I should do next on this channel. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video.